In this week's In-Ear Insights, we're talking about SEO and specifically search data that's available to us as marketers, data that we need to be able to make decisions about what should we be doing in search. There's a ton of new research and new um, uh, points of view about how we should be using things like keyword data. But one of the things that's constant is making sure the data that we're using is reliable. So Katie, Today, I thought we would spend a little bit of time taking a look at the differences between some of the data we get out of uh, third party tools, uh, SEO tools, and then the data that we get from Google Search Console and just what a huge delta there is between the two. But before we do that, um, you do a, obviously a lot of the content creation for Trust Insights. You put together the editorial calendar and things like that. When you're looking at data when you're going after data for that stuff where do you go what like where do you get information that you that you need to put together those things i look in two different places um one is i look at our search console because i want to know what people are searching for when they find us specifically so i want to know i want to try to get in the head of the end user a little bit just to understand this was my intention and this is what I found. And I feel like this was a good resource. So I'm gonna go ahead and click through and read it. And so that helps me start to understand what we specifically are being found for. So I wanna know that information. I also look at uh, Google Trends data. And so what the general population is searching for. And so, you know, we've done other episodes on different ways to use uh, Google Trends search data. And so, you know, is something going to be trending? Is, is something, you know, do people not care about it? And I like to use Search Console with Google Trends because it, for me, what it tells me is, okay, someone is finding us for Google Analytics. Well, are a lot of people going to be finding us for Google Analytics or is just that one person? Is that the only person who cares about Google Analytics? You know, as an example, obviously a lot of people search for it. Um, so like if we have this crazy term like, you know, change, manage, change management process optimization by Trust Insights. And so people are finding us for that it might be a very specific niche audience of people. Whereas if I take that term and put it into Google Trends, I might get zero volume. And so that to me says, okay, only the people who are in the know, know what that term is. I need to find something a little bit more general to bring that awareness. So that's how I think about it. I know there's other tools out there, Chris. And so what I wanna learn from you today is what are the gaps? What am I missing? in terms of the way that I could be planning. Yep. And there's there can be, depending on um, the, the technologies that you're using, uh, some pretty substantial gaps. So let's take a look at, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I'm going to look at two different data sources, but I've mashed them together to make things much harder to read. Uh, <laughs> as, as one does. Happy Monday. As one does. Um, the two sources we're going to look at is one is an SEO tool. Uh, we use a tool called Ahrefs, um, but there's obviously, you know, use the tool of your choice, Moz, SEMrush, SpyFu, whoever it is that you, you prefer to use. Uh, and the other tool we're going to use is Google Search Console. Um, I happen to think that Google Search Console is the best tool for the job because you get a view of what Google sees as opposed to what third-party companies see. And a lot of third company a third party data is it's dependent on where they get their data they get their clickstream data and stuff some companies uh for example used to rely on a company called jump shot before it uh, was acquired and then uh, that data was removed and they've had to make uh inferred models about a lot of stuff that you know essentially they're, they have to guess at because they for good reason don't have visibility to what you or i type into a search engine whereas google being the owner of the search engine does so this is the data for Trust Insights. I've got a bunch of columns here labeled with either Ahrefs or Google Search Console, depending on, on what it's here. And we're gonna look at two different sets of metrics. Um, but what I want you to pay attention most to is not the, the numbers of things, but where there are gaps. 
So here I've sorted this table by <clears throat> um, the pages and the queries, uh, namely, you know, what page is it? And then what is the, the search term associated with that page? And I start off by sorting it by what's called the, the traffic mean or, or how much traffic on average does a page get um, based on the, the term. So here we see um, the home page gets obviously, you know, trust insights. We've got some random stuff here. We've got uh, John's name, uh, influencer emoji and stuff. We're, you know, th this is not entirely bad. Um, you know, there's, there's a few bits and bytes here, but for the most part, um, we do are starting to see things like uh, in this case, a misspelling of TikTok. Um, but that's that what H bios for TikTok or bros for TikTok. A uh, bios. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what bros for TikTok was and why we would rank for it. I, I, I don't know. And, <laughs> and thankfully, we don't. Um, so this is what hrefs, the URLs that hrefs sees uh, us and then the, the associated search terms. If I take that same information and I resort it uh, by what Google Search Console sees, here's the page in Google Search Console. Here's the search term. And then this is uh, the, the traffic uh, for those terms. One of the things that really stands out to me that I find very glaring is look how many pages here are not populated in the HRS column, right? We're mm -hmm. talking probably two thirds of the data um, is reflected in Google Search Console for a variety of different terms, but not reflected in HRS. And to me, this poses an interesting challenge because when I, I'm going to go back here and resort by the Ahrefs traffic column, a lot of the terms here, pretty you know, pretty standard. Trust insights, press mm -hmm. release statistics, data quality framework, and so on and so forth. Disadvantages of predictive approach. Those are bad things to be ranking for, uh, to be found for. But when I again, when I resort by Google Search Console, trust insights, marketing analytics white paper, marketing without data. Um, IGTV, which has gone attribution GA4, Google Analytics 4 attributions, uh, GA4 attribution model. These terms, I feel like, are much more relevant to who we are as a company and, and what the, the kinds of things we want to offer people. You know, it's so it's interesting because I was taking a very rudimentary approach to try to get to this same type of information, what are we ranking for versus, you know, what's actually getting any traffic. Um, and this is showing me a much more efficient and data driven way to do it. Now, is this something that had to be done in R or could I do this kind of thing in Excel with maybe like a VLOOKUP? You absolutely can do this with VLOOKUPs in Excel because this is just binding two tables together on uh, essentially the URL. Uh, is what you're, you're binding on. You're doing what's called a full join, where uh, for those who are not database nerds, you, you have table A and table B. Uh, an inner join is the rows where table A and table B intersect. So only the rows that the two tables have in common. A left or a right join means you get all the rows in A and only the matching rows in B, or all the rows in B and only the matching rows in A. And in a full join, you get everything in A or B, even when there are missing parts. And that's the important part about this um, table is we want to see the missing parts we mm -hmm. want to see in, in on in column one here which is the google search console page and then column three which is the hrefs page we want to see where is there a gap and on the hrefs side we see there's a pretty big gap from what google sees and from what hrefs sees and that what's also interesting too is hrefs is seeing the home page for a lot of these different pages where google is seeing individual pieces of content uh, and i think that's very telling of the fact that again it's not a slam on hrefs or any seo tool it's simply that they have less data to work with google mm -hmm. is the source of the data and so google is going to show very different things now where i do think there is some value for us is to look at the pages where there are gaps um in what Ahrefs has versus what Google does not have. And if so, we would want to use the Google Search Console um, URL submission API to say, OK, does Google not know about this page? Like, did it somehow escape Google's watchful eye? If so, mm -hmm. let's make sure we manually submit it so that um, we're, we're getting found for everything we want to be found for. So it sounds like there's a couple of things you can do with this. One is, as you just mentioned, you can make sure that your site is properly indexed 
Um, but would you then, would the action from this be, so let's say you have <clears throat> in column A, the page, so that's our website page, you have the query, uh, but there's really no traffic or hrefs. Is that something that you would then want to re-optimize that page? Or would you just say, let's create new content around this keyword? Like, what is the so what of this? What do I do? What do I take away? The two metrics that you I would want to pay attention to are the Google Search Console's impressions and me and, and clicks. Because recall in search console data an impression means you, you, that page showed up in a search result and a click means the user saw that page show up in a search result and clicked on it and so when you have low impressions it means google is not showing that page very often if at all and that means you need to optimize the page for search right so you have to make sure that there's topical relevance uh, that there's inbound links and stuff when you have a page that has good impressions but is low on clicks that means that the page did not satisfy the intent of the, the searcher. Like you typed in, you know, journey to AI, you saw the Trust Insights page and the listing, and you didn't click on it because the you saw from the description, you're like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not going to click on that. Um, and so as we look at this data, we'd want to take a, a look at the, those different ratios, like what pages have zero impressions. Okay, great. Those are the ones that if there's search terms that we care about, we got to go and, and sharpen our pencils, you know, make, you know, revise those pages, add new content, uh, mm -hmm. maybe add some multimedia. And then on the pages where there's good impressions and, and low or no clicks, like, okay, we got to go into the our, our uh, rank math uh, add on in WordPress. Does a snippet look appealing, right? Does a mm -hmm. snippet look like a uh, Essentially, it's unpaid pay-per-click ads. So the same copy that you would write in Google ads for that page mm -hmm. should be what that shows up in organic search. So again, if those are pages that are valuable, that's the the action to take would be to tune that tune up those unpaid ad listings, essentially. So when we do this kind of work for clients, essentially uh, what we do um, for those who are sort of wondering how... because you know, handing over a spreadsheet to someone can be overwhelming. So what <laughs> our responsibility as Trust Insights is to take that information and basically break it down to a to-do list. And so we would create two different to-do lists, one for creating net new content and one for tuning up the existing and what's specifically around. So you might have, here's your 10 things to do to create new content. Here's your 10 things to do to clean up and optimize your existing content based on the analysis that we just ran. And then the following month or over the next quarter, what we would do is we would track that to see on April 1st, this is you know where the data stood. On June 1st, this is now the improvement. So you can actually effectively measure how your SEO has been improved. Because I know that that's one of the things that... Um, a lot of our clients struggle with is what is the impact of SEO? How do I know, aside from traffic, that my SEO efforts are doing anything? What is the ROI of my SEO is the magic phrase. And this yeah. is how, this is how you start to measure that. Because if you think about it in terms of your <clears throat> marketing and sales funnel, awareness is always going to be at the top. You have to drive awareness in order to get people to buy anything from you. And so if that part of the funnel is broken, that's where you focus. And that's how you measure the ROI of your SEO is how much traffic, how much awareness you're driving to your site, to those specific pages. Exactly right. The other thing that a lot of people forget about SEO is that it's very much all about power laws. Right. So power laws or Pareto curves, uh, you've heard these two in the 80-20 the rule, except that in SEO, it's more like 95-5. One of the things that you'll notice in any of these reports is you'll get five or 6,000 lines of data to work with. But guess what? Probably the top 10 are the ones that you need to focus on. And the other 5,990, if you've got a ton of bandwidth and, and, you know, and team time, great. You can have people work down the list. Mm -hmm. But you're really going to get a lot of juice for the squeeze on those top 10. And that means that if you get this, for example, as a monthly report, if you run it as a monthly report or you have it in Data Studio as a monthly report, um, if you fix two pages a week, you're going to handle 
you know, probably 80% of, of the impact of your SEO just for handling, you know, two pages a week. So if you can tune up two pages a week, you're going to do okay, right? You're going you're, you're gonna to see benefit. You don't have to do all 6,000. Uh, yes, there is a very long tail in SEO, um, but for the most part, for most sites, it still is that, that short head uh, makes up for the long tail in a lot of ways. So what's interesting, um, you know, I, at least what I've seen is that companies tend to use, you know, an SEO tool, whether it be, you know, an SEM rush or an Ahrefs, but they don't tend to also use Google search console. And I feel like Google, Google search console is underappreciated and it's the unsung hero of actually understanding where your potential customers heads or are at. And so that's one of the things that we, Chris, you and I at Trust Insights want to make sure that we are putting Search Console up on its proper pedestal that it deserves because to your point, the third party SEO tools are really, really good at telling you a lot of information, but it's missing the Google information for the, for most, you know, of these things where Search Console is tied directly into your website and can tell you, here are the terms that people found you for specifically, here's where they went, here's what they did. But also you can then tell Google, hey, I have these pages that I really, really want you to show to people. How can we make this happen? And Google will say, well, here's what's not working on these pages, so go fix those things. And you can't necessarily get that information out of a third party SEO tool. And so um, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not aware, we are launching a new uh, SEO course to teach you all of these uh, tips and techniques and all of the different elements um, and widgets that exist in Google Search Console so that you can apply that to your content marketing and couple that with your existing SEO tools. It's because Google doesn't spend a million bucks marketing it like you know, the, the marketing team at SEMrush spends on, on marketing their tool. And the reason for that is because of its heritage. Google Search Console started out as a tool called Google Webmaster Tools. It was marketed to, to the extent that it was marketed at all, um, a very niche community of people who were webmasters, right? Back in the early 2000s when that was still a cool title to, to have as a, as a career. Um, that has long since gone away. Um, and then over time, it was rebranded to Search Console, positioned more for folks who are doing SEO as opposed to people who are purely webmasters, although there's still a lot of technical stuff in there, like, hey, your web server is slow, or your web server is not secure, or your web server you know, is, is just not showing up at all. You might want to fix that. Search Console, yeah, I mean, when you look at how Google sort of treats it, it really is the redheaded stepchild of digital marketing. It's not marketed. If you go to Google's Analytics Academy, there's not a single course for it, or there's no instructions for it. Um, and even though it's got some really cool features and has gone so, you know, through some major, major revamps over the last few years, it's still largely ignored. And part of that is because getting access to it is kind of a pain. Uh, in order to get access to it, you have to be an authorized uh, party on your company's website, right? So for good reason, companies may say, we don't necessarily want to be putting in, you know, DNS entries uh, into our, our DNS to authenticate every single member of the marketing team, uh, because they don't all need access to it, but at least somebody on the marketing team hopefully uh, has it. And again, because of its webmaster tools heritage, sometimes the access to it may be governed by IT, as opposed mm -hmm. to marketing, and IT is like, yeah, we're not sharing that with you. <laughs> so um, with all of that being said, um, we do recommend that you at least try to get read-only access to your Search Console account. Um, and if you don't have a Search Console account set up for your website, you definitely should do that. And these, all of these steps are things that we walk through in our um, Google Search Console for Marketers course. So Chris, um, this course is now live. This course is available uh, for people to access. Is that correct? Or is that coming this week? Coming this week, there's a few things on the on the polish list that I need to fix, like getting your name to appear correctly on the certificate when you complete. <laughs> but the, but the, the, the value of the course, uh, namely the educational content, that is all done. 
So um, with that, I would say stay tuned. Uh, Chris and I will be launching our Google Search Console course this week. Uh, we'll be making that available for uh, folks to purchase a seat and download uh, the information. So, and it's information that you can go back to to say, oh, how did I do that largest contentful paint piece? What did that stand for again? And you'll be able to go back to. So it will become one of those resources that you can refer to as you're setting up your content marketing plan and executing those plans. One of the things too, I would um, caution about it is that it is intended for beginners, right? So mm -hmm. if you are a, a very, very advanced SEO practitioner, um, if you're already using the URL submission, the API, the data API, you're already using the search console API, it's not, you're gonna probably get very little value out of it because you're already interacting programmatically with Google Search Console. If you are unfamiliar with what the URL submission API is and, and you know, nor do you care and you can't write code, then it is the course for you because we don't do any of that in the course because I was like, do I really want to get into this? No, no, I don't. You know, I, I would slightly disagree with you, Chris, as you're saying it's for beginners. Um, I personally, I don't consider myself a beginner with Search Console. And as I was going through it, I was getting good refreshers and learning mm. about some of the newer features and things that you can do. And really also just, Chris, your perspective on how to analyze the data just within the system itself. And so I would definitely, whether you're a beginner just learning what all of the different features are, or even if you've been doing it for a while, I do think it's a good refresher because it does give you a different perspective on how to use the data to your advantage. That's fair. I, I still would say if you're writing Python code directly to the Search Console API, it's still not, I, I would say maybe. Chris, please stop discouraging high. people from consuming <laughs> our really, really, really good content <laughs> that we've worked very hard on. <laughs> That's true. Um, okay, so when we look at our data here, the hrefs versus search console one of the things we see is there is this very very large gap between these two things um the the caution i guess i would add to this is your seo tools are looking at a broader picture of the market search console will show you data for you for your website and stuff like that everything that you show up for it obviously does not show you data for competitors or other websites and things like that. So you do still need both sets of tools. It's not one or the other, it's both. Um, particularly if you're doing competitive analysis, uh, you do need an SEO tool, a third party tool, because you want your comparisons to be apples to apples, right? You want to, yes, we know what's in a third party tool is gonna be less complete than what's in Search Console, that, without a doubt. But it should be relatively evenly un incomplete across different companies. So if you are, say, Cisco Systems, uh, and you're looking at uh, VMware or other you know, major competitors, you the data you're looking at in a third party tool, apples to apples is still going to be usable in just the third party tool. And one of the things you probably should not do is compare your search console data to a competitor's third-party tool data because you're going to get wildly different results um, and you'll be making decisions incorrectly between the two tools. I think that that's a really, really good point. I also feel like a lot of companies focus too much on what their competitors are doing and trying to meet those versus using that search console data to focus on themselves and what their customers want. And so I think it's a really good opportunity to say, okay, everyone's doing their thing out there. There's a lot of noise out there. Let us focus in on ourselves and what our customers want versus what we think our competitors customers are after. So I think that search console is really good for that. It is. The other thing that is really important about search console that you'll want to do um, is you are going to want to tie it into Google Analytics, uh, particularly Google Analytics 4. Uh, there is an option to bind Search Console data straight into uh, Google Analytics 4. And once you get that in there, then you can start to understand like where is it that you're getting, you know, how does this data work with GA4? If you don't have it bound in, then you're not gonna see it. The data won't be available in the user explorer and stuff. So make sure that you are uh, doing that because 
you can't otherwise see that data. You, um, you know, obviously you can't put third party data <clears throat> um, natively into Google Analytics for, or Google Analytics 3 for that matter. Um, the other thing that I think is really important that people should do is in Google Analytics 4, uh, one of the base reports that is sort of the, the baked in report is the built in attribution modeling. And when you are looking at SEO, when you're thinking about SEO, uh, one of the things you should be thinking about is how does SEO fit into um, our overall uh, channels conversion. So for us for Trust Insights, uh, organic search is a little bit sort of top of the middle funnel, but it actually is you know, the third largest referring source for, you know, sort of that that late touch point before conversion. So it's one of those things that really does, you know, nudge people over the line. So for us, it, it is a priority. It is something that you know we, we need to continue working on. So when you are in your Google Analytics account, one of the things you should be doing is looking at your funnel visualization in GA4 um, and seeing where organic search is. Because if organic search isn't here at all, then okay, you probably uh, don't need to spend a whole lot of time on Search Console, but also you, you're probably missing a marketing opportunity because search should be in there somewhere. Um, and then if you see that search is like 80% of all your conversions, you really should be using Search Console because your business literally depends on it. Mm -hmm. Well, and this goes back to that question of what is my SEO ROI? Where does it fit into my funnel? You have this information <clears throat> at your fingertips if it's set up uh, correctly, which again is something that we at Trust Insights can help you with to make sure that you are set up for success. Exactly. So a couple things to, to take away. Take a look at your, your third-party SEO data make sure that you're using your search console data. You can you can mesh the two together to figure out where the gaps are between, uh, for each of these tools. Anytime search console doesn't have a piece of data that a third party SEO tool does, and assuming it's correct, uh, you wanna make sure that you use the URL submission tools built into search console to make it aware of those pages. Or if it is aware of them and you pull up in the URL inspector in search console, look at that page and say, did you, like Google, do you, are you, are you not showing this page for a reason? Like, is it, is it not there for a reason? And uh, one of the things we go over in the course is how to use that inspector to figure out, okay, here's why this page is, is showing up. And you may have misconfigured your robots file and, and told Google, Hey, don't look at this page. And now you're filled with regret and sorrow. We also tell you what a robots file is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, any parting words, Katie? <sighs> Use the tools that you have. Use the free tools that are built in to your ecosystem in addition to other third-party tools. I think using your own tools is such an underrated thing um, that we want to teach you how to do that more effectively. Okay. Uh, it, it's, um, by the time you watch this, it'll be available. If you want to go take the course, uh, it is at trustinsights.ai slash search console. That's where we're going to put uh, the course. If you've got comments or questions about anything we've talked about in today's show, hop on over to our free Slack group, trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers, where you and over 2,200 other marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. And wherever it is that you watch or listen to the show, if there's a place you'd rather get it, we probably have it. Go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast uh, for all those uh, different listening and watching locations. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon.